So thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, it's great to be here uh, in New York. Uh, I've brought the English weather with me. Uh, <laughs> Actually, it was beautiful weather when I left, so I, this is just preparing me for the English winter. Um, my talk, I guess, dovetails very nicely with George's one, because it's also about moving beyond the cognitive to understand learning as a social process, and also learning as a compassionate endeavor. So not only how can you enable people to learn together, but to do that at massive scale and to enjoy the process. So just a little bit of background for those of you who don't know about the Open University and FutureLearn. Um, so FutureLearn was set up by the Open University. The OU is coming up for its 50th anniversary now. And we're a university with around about 200,000 students uh, who take degree courses and master's courses um, by what we call supported open learning. By supported open learning, um, it's something like a flipped classroom, but without the classroom. Um, so the students uh, study online, and they have the support of local tutors for doing their degree courses. But of course, you can't do that if you want to offer free courses. So the OU, um, back in uh, t October 2013, um, set up the FutureLearn operation to offer massive scale courses. And we developed a new platform. Uh, and we work together now with 72 partners, not just from the UK, but increasingly from around the world offering now 193 courses on a very broad range of business, health, science, and arts. And our demographic is somewhat different to some of the other platforms. We've got 60% female, 40% uh, male, um, and over 2 million users, um, 4 million course signups. And we designed a platform from scratch uh, as a uh, responsive platform so that it works equally on mobile, tablets, and smartphones. And about 25% of our learners access on mobile devices. So that's the background to FutureLearn. Um, those are the partners from the UK, leading universities from the UK. Um, and increasingly, as I say, global universities um, from Europe, from Asia, um, from Australia. Uh, and the Americas. And also we're looking at other kinds of partnerships, so partnerships with specialist organizations and centers of excellence, such as European Space Agency. Um, and working with a broad range of cultural and content partners, notably the BBC. In fact, there's a you know, very strong BBC connection running all the way through um, FutureLearn, as you might expect, because the Open University has had a long-standing partnership with the BBC. Uh, and uh, Simon Nelson, the CEO of um, FutureLearn, is sitting at the back there, who came from um, uh, work on managing major projects at the BBC. So we have that interesting combination a very high quality production of programs and also uh, the learning uh, uh, input that comes from the Open University. And one of our proudest moments, the world's biggest ever MOOC course with 440,000 reg registrations, 270,000 learners for a course from the British Council this summer on preparing for the IELTS exam. So we're pretty pretty pleased with how things are going at FutureLearn. But that's not really what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the pedagogy, the teaching and learning that underpins it. So to start the second part of what I'm going to say, there's a difference between Europe and the US in terms of um, views of MOOCs. And we know this because there have been some comparative studies. Um, one of them was uh, a study of institutional MOOC strategies in Europe by EADTU. And they compared um, Europe and the US, uh, interviewing and polling people who are concerned with MOOC strategy at various universities uh, in Europe, and they compared it with similar data from the US. And as you imagine, quite a lot of the data they found was similar, but some of the survey data was interestingly different. So one of the questions they asked was about whether you see MOOCs as being a sustainable method of offering courses. And in Europe, um, 
over half saw MOOCs as being a sustainable way of offering courses, that there is a way of using MOOCs into the future um, to support the university mission. But in the US, under 20% of the respondents um, answered that MOOCs were sustainable. But perhaps the biggest difference is in answer to the question, are MOOCs important for institutions to learn about online pedagogy? Nearly 100% of the respondents in the European survey answered yes, that MOOCs are important to understand about pedagogy. In the US, um, just over 20% answered yes. So that's the biggest difference between Europe and the US in terms of attitudes towards seeing MOOC platforms as a way of exploring pedagogy, as a way of exploring innovations in teaching, learning, and, ass and assessment. And so for the rest of my talk, I'm going to blast you with pedagogy because I'm going to try and change that attitude towards uh, why pedagogy is important for MOOCs. So let's start with what the pedagogy is of MOOCs. And as most of you know, the major MOOC platforms are based on an instructivist pedagogy of learning as information transfer, of instructor-led courses, of sequencing of learning elements, of a sequence of informing, testing, explanation, and also developing adaptivity and personalization so that each course is adapted to the learner and to the learner's differences based on uh, previous behavior or an inferring of cognitive states. And that kind of instructivist pedagogy online goes back to um, the 1960s. And there's a really nice patent application there that you can see um, for effectively um, instructivist MOOCs, but in 1960s technology, where it was presented through video and you responded by um, clickers on your desk um, to uh, multiple choice quiz answers. But that's the, the classic instructivist pedagogy. And when FutureLearn um, was first setting up, there was already a reaction against that, um, questioning of whether MOOCs really are delivering what they set out to do, whether they are engaging massive numbers of people in innovative ways of learning. And so when we came to design the platform, and we were designing the platform from, from fresh, so we had pretty much an open slate as to what we did in terms of the design of the platform, we had to make some decisions. Were we going to try and go down this line of um, instructivist pedagogy, but with increasing personalization, or were we going to take a different approach? And one of the things we knew designing uh, initially a UK-based platform was we weren't going to compete with the um, other platforms just on the technology, um, because they could throw hundreds of people at the technology design. So we wanted to design a platform that was simple, that was elegant, that was very usable, not over complex, but we also wanted to compete on the pedagogy. We wanted to come up with an approach to teaching and learning that was distinctively different. <clears throat> so the question was, how do we design successful pedagogy-informed massive open courses? And that was the challenge that we were set set by um, a very uh, far-sighted vice-chancellor of the Open University, Martin Bean, who interestingly came from Microsoft and came with a whole set of ideas that shook up the Open University, including setting up FutureLearn. So that was a challenge. And you'll have seen a, a version of this diagram before in George's talk on um, the kind of chronology of MOOCs. And you see it dividing towards um, the uh, edX, uh, the MIT um, MOOCs, and the FutureLearn platform. What's different about them is not the technology, but the pedagogy. So, uh, as George said, it started back in the 2000s and before around open learning and access to learning content, then the connectivist MOOCs, and then the splitting towards the instructivist approach and towards an approach that we adopted of social constructivist learning. So what's that mean? 
<clears throat> so social constructivism engages learners. Oh, it starts from the, the notion that every person constructs their own knowledge of the world, and that they do that by engaging actively with the world, including the world of ideas. But we don't just do this on our own. We learn most effectively when we mutually construct understanding. And so some of the um, theories of learning that informed the design of the platform was firstly some of the um, very important work that was done by um, Meltzoff and colleagues on the new science of learning published in the journal Science. Um, and that said that for the first time, we have the opportunity to develop a science of learning, not just an art and craft of learning, that brings together work on pedagogy, that brings together work on machine learning, on neuroscience and education, bringing these together into a composite understanding of the science of learning. And that paper ended with this challenge. A key component is the role of the social in learning. What makes social interactions such a powerful catalyst for learning? And that we know from small scale studies of learners in small groups, in classrooms, that when people learn together, it's the sharing of ideas, of being able to take one person's perspective, put it alongside yours and come to a common understanding that's a powerful catalyst for learning. So that was one starting point. <clears throat> Another starting point, and I've discovered from conversations it's less well known in the US, is the work of John Hattie. And I really do suggest you go to his book called Visible Learning. And this book was his kind of life's work. It was over 20 years of work. And what he did was he took meta-studies uh, of what makes for effective learning. So he looked at um, these clusters of studies for different factors that influence successful learning. And it ranged from class sizes in schools um, to uh, whether you had a, a, an inspired teacher or not, um, what sorts of uh, presentation of materials, many, many different factors. Uh, and reduce them all to, um, through uh, these meta-studies to a common metric of effect size and found out which were the factors that most influenced learning outcomes. And the book, the hint is in the title of the book, Visible Learning. What he found was, overall, the greatest influencer on learning outcomes was making learning visible. By that I mean making the teacher's understanding of what um, the teacher wants to achieve visible to the learner and making the learner's goals and intentions visible to the teacher. And there are many ways to do that. So uh, encouraging students to set goals at the start of a learning episode, um, providing them with advanced organizers so that they can understand what's intended for them before they start a course or a lesson. And as they progress through the course, making that progression visible to them. And he said, what is most important is that teaching is visible to the student and that learning is visible to the teacher. The more the student becomes the teacher and the more the teacher becomes the learner, then the more successful are the outcomes. So that was a second starting point. The third starting point was around narrative and learning. Um, and narration is absolutely central to the way in which we make sense of the world. Um, it helps us to remember, it helps us to think, it helps us to communicate, because it allows us to tell stories to ourselves and to other people about how we progress through the world and our understanding of the world. It connects the pieces of knowledge together into a coherent whole. So narration, storytelling, is the way we make sense of the world to ourselves. It's the way our parents um, induct us into the world by telling stories to us. And it's the way that we motivate students to continue with the course by offering them threads, coherent threads, that pull them through a story from beginning to end. So narration is both sense-making and it's also motivational. So that was a third thread. So those were the starting points. <clears throat> then the challenge was, well, we're not simply adopting methods from 
previous studies of education or previous platforms, we've got to think about it for massive scale, for doing um, visible learning, collaborative learning, um, reputation, feedback and reward, um, narrative learning and storytelling at massive scale. So what does this mean? Well, some educational methods get worse with scale. So tennis coaching, say, soccer coaching. You can do it to you know, a couple of people for tennis coaching, a soccer team um, for, for football coaching. But they get worse with scale. It's much harder to do that to 200 people or 2,000 people. There are some educational methods that are pretty much impervious to scale. And that's the instructivist sort of teaching, which is why it works um, at large scale. It's no worse lecturing to 200 people or lecturing to 2,000 people or 20,000 people. It works pretty much the same. But what kind of educational methods get better with scale, that actually improve with scale? So for that, we went to... Um, some of you come across it, Metcalfe's Law. So Metcalfe published a paper in 2007 where he suggested something that everybody knows intuitively, which is that for some network systems, the value of a product or service increases with the number of people using it. So the telephone system is a good example of that. When you only had two telephones in the world, it was not terribly useful. You could only phone one person. But as more and more people get connected, particularly as you start then to have international connections, then that system gets more and more useful. So the telephone system is an example of Metcalfe's law, of a system that gets better the more people that use it. But of course, education isn't just about connecting people. It's not about data flow. So they've got to enable successful learning. And as Stephen Downs said, networks enable learning if they support conversations that are new, important, timely, usable, understandable, appropriate, and trusted. Now, we have to form networks of people that we trust and that we want to interact with and learn from. In other words, we want to develop effective social networks for learning. And if you can do that, then it starts to scale up. There's one other wrinkle on this, which is that for a network to be successful in some areas, and education is one of those, then everyone needs to benefit. And in education, you've got basically two different sides. You've got the learners and the educators, and both need to benefit from scale. So the learners need to have greater opportunity to learn. They need to have ease of use. They need to have value that gets better with scale. And for the educators, they need the opportunity to teach. They need to manage that complexity that comes from scale. And one of the problems with scale is that as the network gets bigger, then so does the complexity. And they need to gain insight from that value, from that data. So that's the background. So we then said, OK, is there a theory of learning that really works with scale that encompasses all of these other aspects that I've talked about. And so we went to a generalized learning theory, again, that is not particularly well known in the US. And to us, that was a benefit, because we wanted something that the Yanks didn't really understand. Um, <laughs> and so we based it on work from an educational theorist called Gordon Pask. Uh, and also more recent work uh, in interpreting that from, by Diana Lorillard and colleagues. It's based on a model of learning as conversation. Now, what I'm going to do here is grossly simplify that. Um, it was, you know, again, another person's life work. Um, it comes from a background in cybernetics um, and the idea of second-order cybernetics. So I won't bore you too much with it, but basically first-order cybernetics is about how organisms respond to the world. So how a plant responds to light or how an animal responds to hunger. Second-order cybernetics is how you know that you're doing it. Um, how do you know when you're hungry? How do you know when you're satisfied? And you know about that. You come to know through conversation. You come to know through conversation with yourself as you reflect on your experience, as you reflect on your actions. 
and you have conversations about what's right, what's wrong, what's high, what's low, what's black, what's white. Um, you reflect on differences. But also, you have conversations with other people. And you have conversations at two levels. You have conversations at the level of actions about things that you are doing. Um, and you're doing that around some shared medium. It might be a piece of text that you're critiquing, you're discussing with somebody else. It might be a computer program that you're trying to debug. So you're having conversations at the level of actions. What do I do now? How do I do this? What's going wrong? And you also have conversations at the level of descriptions. So not only what am I doing, but why am I doing this? What am I trying to solve with this? What's the purpose of this learning? Um, what are we trying to achieve? And you need to have some medium for doing that as well. You need to have some space to have those sorts of conversations, whether it's a forum, whether it's a concept map that you're trying to um, create together. So you have multiple conversations. And most of teaching and learning can be modeled through this conversational model. So if the partner is a teacher, then you're having uh, a, you know, a, a conversation in the classroom with a teacher. Or the partner can be another learner, it can be a peer, it can be a more able peer, it can be an equal peer. There are many different ways of modeling this, these conversations within this network. So it's a very general, generic process. But it's also one that's implementable. When we showed this to our tech team at FutureLearn, they got it. They got the idea of trying to create as many conversational flows as possible um, between teachers or educators and learners, between learners and themselves, so allowing to, uh, reflection. Each of those lines is something that could be implemented in software. And that's what we set out to do, to try and implement this conversational model. So it was about enabling effective conversations for learning at levels of action, about activities, what it is you're doing, and description about concepts for hundreds of thousands of people from many backgrounds and cultures. So how does it actually work in practice? So that's the, the theory that we based it on. So this is the FutureLearn platform, if you haven't seen it. That's what it looks like when you come into it. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples from actual courses. The first one is from a course um, that was from University of Strathclyde on an introduction to forensic science. And I like this because it, imp uh, it shows all of the different aspects that I've been talking about. So it's for giving people who probably watched a TV program, CSI, um, got a bit interested in forensic science and wants to find out a bit more about it. What's this thing called forensic science? And that's the front page to it. As they go into the platform, this is what they see. So one of the things we try to do, as I say, building on Hattie's work, is to make as much visible as, of the learning visible as possible. So here you can see your... Um, in week two, you can see that little arrow there. Um, the course is six weeks long. Um, the course has actually got to the fifth week, so this person is uh, either gone back to week two or is starting to catch up. And for week two, you can see all the different learning elements, which we call steps. So courses are made up of weeks. Weeks are made up of activities that package together learning elements, and each of these activities has a clear learning objective, and then the activities are made up of the, the atoms, the fundamental pieces of learning called steps. Then when, let's look at one of those steps. So this is it here. The whole course was based around a kind of soap opera with cliffhangers. So each week, um, there was a reconstruction of a crime scene. So it was an actual crime that took place in the 1980s where somebody was murdered in their car. And the challenge is to use different forensic techniques each week to try and solve this mystery, to try and solve this murder. But not to do it just on your own, but to do it with thousands of other people, to hold conversations about what might be the cause of the murder. So I'll just do you a little video clip um, here from um, one of the, um, the videos on the course. Three finger marks of interest were found on the passenger door. 
and one on the driver's and door. And one on the driver's door. These were from the same person. These were from the same were person. Were not from either of were the wards. From either and of were the wards. clean enough to and suggest were clean enough that they were of recent origin. That they were of recent origin. The finger marks were the finger marks were compared to prints in the national and database. And a match was found. And a match was found with marks unidentified from marks from a scene investigated during an unsolved drug case. Although this supported, Although Mr. this Ward's supported events, Mr. Ward's version of DCI events, DCI Morrison was, DCI still, not Morrison sure. was still not he sure. Therefore returned he therefore returned to Ross Friday to interview the staff, to interview who, had the staff the who had been on duty in the, the restaurant the murder. on the afternoon of the murder. You see that with every British video you have to have a pot of tea there. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was the you know, part of the reconstruction of the crime scene. And in this case, you're expected to do fingerprint analysis for it. So that's the video. And you can just see at that right-hand side um, that it says 1,084 comments. So this is where the learners come in. So if you click on that, then this is what you get. You get a kind of water cooler flow of comments. So we wanted to make it as easy as possible for somebody to learn vicariously, so just to learn from other people's commenting, but also to add your own. So if you want to, you just add a comment at the top. So let's just take one of those comments. Um, and it's pretty much at random. I just came to this page. And at the bottom, there's a there, Reader Raymond. You may just be able to see it. And this is what she commented. Um, the information in this video raised more suspicions. Mr. Duggan gave the wrong address, which seems so contrary to the happenings, as he was the one who called the police to the crime scene. Mr. Ward went opposite to the road he came from, and so on. So she's trying, along with all these um, uh, over a thousand other people, to solve this murder mystery. If you then click on the profile for Rita Raymond, um, then you find that um, she is a... Uh, from Pakistan. Um, she's uh, somebody who's a, a, a graduate student there who's interested in, um, has a professional interest in crime and forensics. And you can see the other comments there that um, she made. And I'll talk in a minute about how we're using social network techniques um, to uh, then engage the learners together with their comments. And I just want to pass on a little bit more to the rest of the course. So as well as learning the theory, as well as discussing with other learners and trying to solve the mystery, you've also got the practical activity as well. So part of this was taking your own fingerprints, and you were taken step by step through the fingerprint analysis, how to take fingerprints um, yourself in your own home using um, uh, sticky tape. The great thing about this course was it really drove people forward because of the storyline. And in fact, on the last week of the course, there was a great reveal at 8 o'clock on a Friday evening. Um, the educators revealed who had actually done the murder. And literally, people pulled their cars over to the side and were uh, logging on to try and find out who had done the murder. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you because the course is still running, so I'm not going to spoil it for you by saying who had done the murder. But it wasn't the butler. So that's one course. The other one, um, which I can't resist talking about, is our biggest ever course, which was the Understanding IELTS one um, from the British Council. And the British Council had just been amazing as a partner because they have this huge publicity machine. Um, so apparently uh, in China, the equivalent of Twitter, because Twitter isn't um, uh, uh, made available in China, the Chinese equivalent of Twitter, the British Council has a million followers. So they have a huge publicity machine. And um, so for this course, they attracted 420,000 people who registered, 270,000 learners from around the world. Many their first time learning online. 35% um, of the people contributed to the discussions, 25% on mobile devices. And that's just one of the early videos. And as you might just see there, 56,656 comments just on that one video. Um, so um, we were then faced with an issue, which is that what we tried to do was to make the conversations flow alongside the content. So not to send people off to separate forums, but to have the, the conversation associated with the context of 
the learning material. When we set up the platform, we expected that a few people might do this, that you know, we might attract a few people to, have, to make comments. We had no idea we were going to get this kind of scale of 56,000 comments on one video. So then we were faced with the pleasant problem of how on earth do you make sense of all those comments? And some of the learners got very worried you know, that they couldn't look through even 100 comments, never mind 56,000. So how can they learn effectively if they can't read all the comments? So we then had to do work of preparing the learners that you know, you're not expected to read all the material any more than if you go to a conference, you're not expected to take part in all the conversations around every table. But we also started to bring in social network techniques in order to help the learners to, and the educators to manage that process. So as along the top now, we have a most liked button. If you click on that most liked button, then the best conversations start to rise to the top. They rise because we've got a follow mechanism uh, and a likes mechanism. So you can like any conversation, and the more people who like it, the more it rises up the list of most liked. But also, we encourage the educators to come in and add their comments to their responses to some of the most liked comments, the ones that they think are most valuable. And we have a follow mechanism where we encourage the learners to follow the educators so more people are drawn to the most liked comments that then have educator responses and are then followed by other learners. So we have ways now of managing that social profile to make the best conversations rise to the top. And if you just take one person there, um, again, pretty much at random, somebody who responded to a most liked comment his name is Tariq Abdal Qadr, and you can see his other um, comments there. One of them was in um, response to another learner who was being encouraged to post their um, uh, samples of English. So they were using an upload um, to uh, a site where they could post their short samples of English and then get other learners to comment on them. So. Uh, then he was commenting, um, Natalia, you're fluent and have a clear pronunciation, well done. So you're seeing these conversations not only flowing alongside the content, but also flowing alongside the learner contributions as well. So we have brought in mechanisms such as replies, liking, following, and filtering to manage these massive scale conversations. So this is where we are um, at the moment. We have um, discussions linked to content. Um, we have a peer review process, which, uh, and also um, discussions at um, that higher level where learners are encouraged to comment on um, their uh, assignments, where they're encouraged to comment on material that other learners have posted. So there's higher level discussions. And we also have um, shared media for doing both those discussions and also for doing the lower level activities um, such as um, creating computer programs, um, creating videos, uh, uh, engaging with other learners in interactive uh, activities. But for the last part, for the last five minutes, I want to talk about um, another aspect, which is analytics. Um, because that's, again, part of our learning, part of our pedagogy. It's the way in which, then, that learner activity can inform the learning for the future, learning by the learners themselves, but also by the educators. So a little bit, just for five minutes, on analytics. So that's the top-level analytics. As I said, 61% male, 39%, sorry, 61% female, 39% male, and a roughly even age profile from... 18 through to 65. Here are some of the main um, uh, I indicators that we use. So 2.6 million joiners. Of those, around 52% become learners who start the course. 84% of those become active learners um, who um, mark one or more of the steps of the learning is complete, because for each of these steps of the learning elements, you have to mark it explicitly as complete. 43% returning learners, 
on average who complete the entire course, and each platform has a different metric for completion. The one we use is that you have to have uh, finished over half of the steps, the elements on the course, and also done all the assignments. And what we're particularly pleased about is that 40% of our learners engage socially. They post one or more comments. What I'm going to show you now is, <clears throat> for the first time, a comparison that we've done with some of the other platforms. Um, so we try to do a fair comparison. So we're comparing here future learn data for courses of five weeks or longer. So we've taken out the short courses where you're likely to have a higher completion rate, and we've taken out the courses that don't have tests. So these are for future learn courses um, up to um, December 2014. Um, compared with the Coursera was published data, it was only for one course, um, a course on uh, business methods. Um, so as well as that, we got data from the only other university in the UK that is both using FutureLearn and Coursera platform, which is Edinburgh University. And we've got the data from Edinburgh so that we can do a comparison along those metrics and also from a published paper on edX. So how do they compare? The number of registrants um, is a fair bit smaller, partly because that was in the early days. Um, now, following the British Council courses, the average, the mean number of learners is going to be a lot higher in future learn. Roughly, the other um, metrics of learners who are converted into registrants um, is about the same. The percentage of active learners, the ones who um, engage with the material, about the same. The biggest difference is in the social learning, the number of people who post um, comments. So in Future Learn, um, it's around, uh, for those earlier courses that we're using the data for now, 36%, compared with 9 to 12% for the other platforms. And in terms of completion rates, 17% um, on average, compared with 5 to 8%. Interestingly, Edinburgh has a similar, for its Coursera courses, has a similar completion rate, slightly lower. One of the reasons for that is that they've cherry-picked the courses. They've um, decided to put on courses that are aimed at people with particular specialist interests. Equine nutrition is the famous one that they did, which is the, one of the highest ever completion rates. So um, the Edinburgh courses uh, are slightly different to some of the other platforms because they have particularly chosen courses for cohorts that um, have uh, specialist interests. So that's the comparison with other platforms. A few other things. Um, we're now starting to use the analytics to gain insight because analytics are only really of value if you can make use of them. There's no point in collecting data if you can't use it. So the, this is the data that we have on platforms, um, on, uh, on devices. So as you see, most of our learners still use desktops but increasing numbers are using tablets and mobile, and you're finding interesting profiles there. So for instance, you can see just there with the blue, um, 11 o'clock at night, people are using tablet computers. Why is that? Because they're taking them to bed and catching up with their course just before they go to bed on their tablets. So if we drill down a little bit, we can then start to use analytics to answer questions, answer questions about the learning. And one of the first questions we wanted to ask was, how long should a video be? And that there is a plot of video length against dropout. Not just dropout from the video, but dropout from the entire course. And what you find is that up to about 10 minutes, you're not getting much dropout, and then suddenly, that happens. So the answer to the question of how long should a video be is around eight minutes, eight to ten minutes, unless you want to have increasing numbers of people leaving the platform. Again, um, peer review, we've got the top level data that we get from peer review, but you can also drill down. So this here is the number of minutes between viewing your assignment what you have to do for the first time and submitting that assignment. So between first seeing um, what you have to do for your assignment and actually submitting your assignment, and up the left-hand side is the number of words of the assignment. 
So you would kind of expect that the more time you spent on writing an assignment, the longer it would be. And to some extent, that's right. But what's happening here? Here. You've got 500-word assignments, 1,000-word assignments that have been submitted in 30 seconds. Any suggestions about what that might be? <laughs> so these ones up here? Yeah, copy and paste. Um, and down here, you've got people who are just writing rubbish. Um, <laughs> so we're starting to gain insights. So we could filter out these ones where people are writing gibberish. And as educators, you really want to look at these ones because these are the ones that are just copy and paste and you don't want to submit them to peers to review. So that's where analytics is starting to give you insight. Another insight we had was that we started to ask the designers of the courses, or we suggested to them, that they have a discussion after the peer review so that you not only have the peer review and the feedback, but you also have a general discussion on your experience. What was it like to do that assignment and to discuss with other learners? One of the things we found was that 20% of the assignments were completed after the learner had looked at the discussion. So the discussion was after the assignment, what 20% of the learners did was skip to the discussion to find out from the other learners whether the assignment was worth doing before they went back to the assignment. So you're finding some interesting patterns now of the way in which people progress in a long linear way through the course, in an opportunistic way, to try and learn from the experience of other learners. And the last thing, it's coming back to... Um, what George said about um, courses that really make a difference, about compassion in learning. Analytics are all very well in terms of collecting data, but behind all of these analytics are some real human stories. And this is one of them, that we had a course um, on Ebola. Um, and this is one comment from uh, one of the learners. I'm writing to you from the Médecins Sans Frontières Bo Ebola Treatment Centre in Sierra, Sierra Leone. As an expat doctor, I found your course on Ebola in context to be excellent. Our national staff, who are local Sierra Leone nurses and clinical officers, have enrolled in the course on their mobile phones. However, because internet is poor or not available, they've been unable to attend the courses or stream videos. In turn, with the help of MSF, I've been able to download the videos and articles, and together with, in a group of around 40 people, we've, cre we've completed your course. So that's a group of people on the ground in Sierra Leone using that course in a small group to support their learning of Ebola. So it's those sorts of stories that really make a difference and really bring it home to you that... <laughs> Designing MOOCs is partly about really effective pedagogy, about bringing people together into rich conversations from different cultures where the larger the scale, the better the conversations, the richer the discussions. But it's also about individual stories, how each course can make a difference to each person. And to finish off then, um, this is where we are now. We're in terms of massive scale social learning based on the conversational model. There's a lot more to be done. There are many different um, sorts of conversations that we can support, and we're working now on developing the platform to support other types of social and collaborative learning around group learning, peer assessment, social annotation. And in general, we want to produce pedagogies that improve with scale, that are connected with insightful analytics. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm.